guys, welcome back. So today uh, we're doing another State of the Second, and this is regarding uh, some of the stuff that's going on with the FBI, the NICS system, and the ATF, and you're going to want to watch this video because the FBI in cohorts with the ATF, they're literally building a database of gun owners. And now this is specifically banned by federal law. The Firearm Owners Protection Act was supposed to protect us from this and make it illegal for these agencies to do this, but they're doing it anyway. And Congress can pass laws that can basically nullify what we call FOPA or the Firearm Owners Protection Act. And that's kind of what they did with a recent law that passed under many people's radar, which is called the Nix Denial uh, Notification Act of 2022. So with that being said, I have a couple of folks with me today. We once again have Jason with us today. Hey guys. And then we have Dave here as well from Copper Custom. And we're gonna talk about what's been going on and kind of the history of ATF and their you know, shenanigans and how they've been for some time building a database of gun owners. So Dave, I know your family's been in the firearms business since the fifties, right? And you know, kind of the history <clears throat> of ATF and how they've kind of evolved and how uh, we went from basically gun owners being mostly left alone with the exception of having to fill out a 4473 form to you know, seeing through your own eyes at gun stores over the decades of how ATF has been slowly doing things. We've all seen the pictures of ATF agents taking photos with their cell phones when they're you know doing inspections, things they're not supposed to be doing, uh, taking customer data that they're not supposed to be taking lawfully. All this stuff has been happening throughout the years and it's getting worse every time they pass a new gun control act or even when they pass a budgetary act they're slipping this stuff in under the radar and it's making it harder for us to avoid being on a list well, i think the big story over the over the the decades that this has been going on is it's not a, a one big push for information basically what's been going on since since the Knicks started is they start all these smaller programs related to NICS, reporting programs related to NICS, that gather information independently, argue, arguing that, okay, well, in order to uh, track, have a better availability of tracking trafficking, we have to get this report from people on this type of transaction, right? And so by keeping it a, you know, a, a niche reporting requirement, they kind of get around the, the the FOPA rules where they're they're basically not seen as gathering one big registration. Right. But over the years, they've had this reporting program, and then another reporting program, and then some adaptation to the forty four seventy three background check forms, and uh, uh, procedures for on FFL audits. Every single one of these things gathers information, right? Mm -hmm. But essentially there's got to be a place where all this information accumulates back to for investigations, which is really what, what nobody really knows behind the scenes, unless you're, I, I would say an ATF. Until a whistleblower answer. comes forward. We're not really right. Privy so, to what they're doing. You know, the question would be, how is that compiled in, in the span where now, if, if there's an investigation going on and they need to gather information, where is that data patient? How is it searchable uh, currently? And nobody really knows that we know that it's searchable. Uh, we know that that is compiled somewhere, right? But like you said, unless we have a whistleblower who has intimate knowledge of it comes forward, that that's not really going to happen. So, um, an know, example of this would would be something like a fairly recent change, where uh, and I say recent, it's been it's been several years, but the multiple handgun purchase thing, right? So yeah. when somebody comes in and buys more than one handgun in a set period of time, then the FFL is required to fill out a form and send that to the ATF. And that form includes more information on the person that has purchased more than one handgun. So on a standard 4473, when you purchase a firearm, uh, it has the make, model, serial number, type of firearm caliber on the form. When we run the checks, that check, that information, that gun, specific gun information is not given to the ATF on the check. All it is is type of firearm. So they know if you're buying a handgun, handgun, long gun, receiver, whatever. So generic right. titles of, of what you're purchasing. If they wanted further information on that specific firearm that you're purchasing, they would have to contact and run a trace or request it uh, to be able to get it. And then and they, the ATF 
per FFL licensing can request a 4473 and by license agreement, we have to give that to them for just what's what's specifically requested. Now what that the multiple handgun sale form does is if you buy more than one handgun from an FFL in a five day span, we are required to fill out this form that shows all those handguns purchased in that five day span, customer information, including address and all that. And that is sent not only to the ATF, um, but also the uh, state police of your and of FBI, your state. right? Because it, well, it, it goes to NICS, it's the NICS system, which is ATF and FBI jointly. Right. Right. So when I say the NICS or ATF, you can pretty much assume they're working assume collaboratively. Correct. Yes, correct. Um, and so, you know, their claim and and I'll do a little bit to kind of explain what, what we've seen as a result of these forms. So their claim is the multiple handgun sale form is a tool that they can use that helps identify tra trafficking trends. So, for example, if somebody is buying a large quantity of the same type of inexpensive handgun, that would say to them, hey, this is is why are they buying five, 15 Glocks five or 15 Jennings Glock or 17s at a time right. or, or, you know, whatever. So their claim is that they look at those by hand and make a judgment call and like, hey, this looks suspicious or this doesn't look suspicious, right? And to their credit, those forms are used a lot when they visit people. When you hear people being visited by the ATF, many times it's as a result of these multiple handgun sale forms. So, you know, let's say guys, you know, cause you can legitimately buy a firearm as a gift. So let's say a guy's got three sons and he buys them all Glock 17s for Christmas. He's reported as doing that, right? right. Yeah, you know, that's reported and they can come visit and like, hey, what are you doing with these Glock 17s? Do you have them in your possession? Did you give them, you know, did you, are you selling them? Whatever. And I'm not an attorney, but in my case, I'd ask them for a warrant. If they didn't have one, I'd say, have a nice day and close the door. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, with any law enforcement, you make sure you're aware of your rights and you yep. take advantage of them. Don't put yourself at, at unnecessary risk. Yep. Not giving legal advice in this video, guys. Right. Um, so that, that is definitely a major reporting program that has been started that really, I mean, that's one of the major ones that gives them immediate information over specifically the firearms that you're purchasing, um, including make, model, serial number, when, when you purchased it, you know, all that, your name and address. Um, so that, that's one of the major ones. The other one that is fairly major that kind of goes hand in hand with it a little bit is, uh, uh, and, I should have looked at this before I, I came on here, but there's a program, it's called a used handgun report. So, And this is a relatively new dis development, right? No. No, oh, this, this has is been around for a while. something that's flown under the radar for quite a while. Because um, I just heard of it, like in the last six months or something? Or? Yeah. And in, because in, um, my family's business has been, I've been doing this for close to 20 years. Yeah. And my family's business was doing this fairly, fairly long ago. Uh, as far as I can remember. Um, but it's it's a huge used handgun report. It's a program that says if you have so many traces, firearm traces per year where the ATF requests uh, a, four, a 4473 information trace, if you have so many a year, then you're automatically required to give quarterly reports on used handgun transactions. And these are only handguns in, right? So this isn't giving the customer purchasing information or anything like that um, right it's, off the bat. It's giving it's giving the ATF, FBI, NICS. So they're the, getting a the information on the gun. Of but used that's, handguns that are coming in. But they're not requesting the seller or trader. Not initially on the report, but here's okay. how this has been working. So we send over a quarterly report that has all those handguns in it. And then almost immediately, we will see a series of traces off of that report. And then through the traces is how they can get people's information. Again, through a trace, we are required to give that information per, per your FFL license. So if they, they do a formal uh, trace request, and uh, if we don't provide that back to them... They put you out of business. 
they can pull your license. Yeah, they will under they this will. administration. Yeah. They've, they've, they've yanked thousands of Correct. licenses. And keep in mind, folks, that these requests oftentimes will come via email, right? And it can go to the spam folder. It may not get delivered. And then it's up to the agent that sends it being honest and saying, oh, I sent that request and they never there responded. Is no, there is no standardized way of trace requests. We get phone calls. We'll get emails. We'll get emails from um a local you know let's say for us it would be chicago or we have a smaller local office or it could come from the national atf you know request so there, right. there's no standardized way of doing it those requests can come down in any which fashion and if you don't comply with those requests in a certain amount of time then it counts as a strike and they can pull your license yep but we learned through a recent audit that one of the reasons they will yank a license is if you failed to respond to a, Correct. a, a, a trace request. So previously, this would be uh, a slap on the wrist, perhaps being put on probation or maybe a fine if it's really bad. But now it's a mandatory revocation for your license. Yeah, I mean, under the, the new under the, this administration. Yeah, the the uh, the consequences of not complying with with any ATF regulation right now is far more dire under this administration. We've seen a lot more FFLs getting put out of business yeah. or, or licenses pulled for according to our legal team at goa that's Correct. that's a, they, Correct. they've been yanking thousands of licenses for what was otherwise now minor infractions that use handgun report here's here's the 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 circular detriment to successful ffls because if you're in business if you're an ffl in business for a long time and or you grow and your volume of sales increases your now your your pool of firearms sold that can be traced is much much larger so uh so my family's business started in 52 which means by the 90s they had a huge volume of firearms that were sold in this area um, that could eventually get into reasons to be traced right so inevitably, any growing FFL or large volume FFL will be put on this program eventually just from a sheer numbers game. Yep. Now, once you submit your user gun report and they start tracing off of that, they almost have you in a loop that you're always going to be part of that program because they're running traces off of what you're giving, which calls off keeps you qualified report, for the, this which program. Keeps you qualified for the report. Right. So it's not like, oh, next year I didn't have as many because you know so i don't have to comply it's almost like once you're in it yeah you're always in it mm -hmm. right so those are two of the major programs um you know we had mentioned you know incremental changes on the 4473 and what what are required um and kind of think what kind of spurred us making this video now is like in the last 48 hours we've seen a change on what they have information they've requested on delayed 4473 so, delayed and denied yes yeah so very rarely <clears throat> when you run a check is the denial immediate it does happen very very rarely a handful a year but almost always if they, it goes to further review which they delay it and then they have a three business day uh, uh, limit at right. which they can give you a response or they if they haven't given you a response in those three business days, then you can proceed with transaction, transaction. Firearm. which they're trying to do away with. Right. As of about 48 hours ago, when a gun gets pushed to delay, they automatically require the customer information, including residential address, which is not given on a normal background check. Right. So you have, you know, name, birth date, social, if they decide to put it, you know, all that information. Whatever's on the 4473. Correct. And, but the address is on the 4473, but they don't request that immediately. Right. The, yeah. Now on delay, that is is immediately requested. Now to put this into perspective, I have a U-pen from years and years and years ago. So I would get delayed mm, once. U-pen on. stands for Unique Personal Identification Number. It acts as a, as a almost like a... It's a pre-background check. A social security background check number it's a specific right. number assigned to you so that they can more easily identify you in the NICS system. kind of like the tsa pre-system right yeah you submit to a background check then they put that on file so that supposedly keeps you from getting delayed right Correct. and so years and years and years ago i'd get delayed maybe once out of every 
10 handgun or rifle purchases. And then it became one in five. Then it became every single time I was buying a gun. This, this was taking place years ago. Right. And that, that was through your family business. And it was, I think you or somebody at, at the store had said, here, just take this, get a U-pen. And I didn't know anything about the program. It's basically like filling out a form four, if you will. You give them all your information, do a background check, and then you give it a PIN number, a U-PIN number. And so you put that on your 4473 form, and that's supposed to keep you from getting delayed or denied. I still get delayed. Well, they changed I the, still get delayed. In the last couple of years, they changed that program. It used to be that it would prevent you from getting delayed. Then the NIC system changed the program. It says now you can only get delayed for like 24 hours or something. I'd have to go yeah. back and read it, but they changed it. But even before they changed that, I was still getting delays periodically. And delays can happen because of just administrative administrative issues. Oh, right? yeah. They're short staffed that day. They have a huge volume of, of requests coming in. And if they can't fulfill those requests in a certain amount of time, they automatically delay them so that they can deal with it at another time. Right. Just like when we go through panic buying sprees, right? When there's a, a bunch of people buying guns, the delays become more common because it's just a sheer volume because millions yeah. of people are buying guns. And you know, because because not only that, but even approvals, same day approval, like when it's like during COVID, normally when you fill out a check, usually response time is five to 25 minutes. It's usually what we talk, hey, we're gonna, it's gonna be back five to 25 minutes. During the, the, the COVID panic buying, we were seeing sometimes 40 to hour and a half on approvals. Mm -hmm. So I mean, somebody who's walking around and, and doing that. Um, we also see a higher percentage of delays during that time because anything that's that's even remotely requires a little bit of extra work is just automatically pushed to delays. Right. And um, and then the, again, they just deal it with it. At a but later then all rate. that information under this new system gets entered, and so the chances of getting delayed is pretty um, pretty good. And also, uh, GOA estimates that roughly ninety percent of the denials are false that mm -hmm. they're they're mistaken and so and and you've kind of echoed that you, you i think you gave a slightly lower number like 85 percent or something or or, or I'm, something okay. like that. I'm i'm echoing numbers that that i've heard goa and stuff say so you know i've not looked at that i don't know even where that information would be publicly available right. as far as percentages go um so i guess my evidence is a little bit more anecdotal right. as far as denials coming down um but denials and delays are generally speaking there's no reason for them the vast majority of the time it gets resolved because it was some other issue and the, the person's able to pick up their firearm the problem therein lies if all these denials and delays are you know not legitimate atf is now collecting all this data on people for bogus reasons because they're not criminals. They're not, they're not being delayed because they're criminal, not being denied because they're criminal. It just happened because something went wrong at, at Nick's. And now all their information has to be sent to this new system, which gets disseminated out to local law enforcement. And in the case of denials, there could be a criminal investigation. And even though it's a bogus denial. And even though that address information is being put on your 4473, all that is is removing a step from the, the ATF a pretty significant and, and effort filled step to get that information of, of processing a formal trace. Now it's just given over at the time of the check and they have that information regardless of it, if you're approved or denied, you know, right. now they have that information already in the system. Now, maybe the most significant issue with that would, would lead to two two issues that would lead to a large registration and, and are and have been under, at least that, that's my opinion. Um, number one, audits. So every FFL gets audited. Every FFL is required to give the compliance agents the A&D, their, their acquisition disposition, disposition books. That's what they go off of to check your 4473s as well as your inventory. Now, most of the federal firearms license, especially of volume, have gone digital, right? So oftentimes they request it as a digital file. You can still give them paper, but then they retain that paper copy, which means they have complete, anytime they come do a compliance check, they're getting a complete A&D record 
of your books, at least since, I mean, they can really request any time frame they want. It's usually for the last at the five very years least, or so. Yeah, I mean, now with 4473s, depending on how fast, they're coming since the last audit, right? Hey, right. give us back your 4473s for the last audit, give your A&D for this, this amount. Right. So they gather that, but then they retain that. It doesn't go away. They don't. And they're give not that supposed back. to, by federal law. They're not supposed to keep this information. Well, here's the thing: is is by FFLs per your license are required to give that to them. Now, legally, they're not supposed to make it into a database, right? Right. But we all know what they're doing with it. They've but been caught red-handed correct, already. Correct. And we've we've saw. I mean, there was video footage of an audit going on where the, the they had given her paper, right? And she immediately was taking pictures, taking pictures. of the paper, digitizing. Right. Right. A paper copy, right? So we've already seen it happen. We know what's going on. Even if you don't give them a digital copy, they're going to do- They're going to take whatever they want. Digitize it, right. right? So that's number one. Number two, as FFLs go out of business, sell, you know, give up their license, whatever, the 4473 documents that are ha have been accumulated, because we're required to keep those on premises for a minimum of 21 years, I believe. Um, but you're not allowed to destroy them. So let's say after 21 years, I was like, oh, I, I don't want to hold on to my ones that are 30 years old. Right. I can't destroy them. I have to give them to the ATF. And if I go out of business or I sell and a light, the licensees change, those all have to be given to the ATF. ATF wants those records, yep. So what we don't know, I mean, what I have a pretty good, I, through conversations we've had with they're not destroying the information either. Correct. They don't want you to and destroy it because not, they want it. They want it for a specific and reason. It's not like they have it sitting in a warehouse in paper form in the boxes no. you gave it over. They're digitizing it. They have to. Right. And so if it's digitized and it stands to read a reason, it is searchable. And so if there was a gun that was sold in nineteen ninety two or let's say nineteen ninety, over that amount, that forty four seventy three has been given to the ATF. There has to be a searchable database to get the customer information from ATF investigators. Yeah. It's, it has to be. So um, you look at that program. So 4473, uh, um, giving 4473s, your audit system in which they gather acquisition disposition, disposition records. You look at multi-handgun multi sale forms. You look at used gun reporting. You look at, you know, changes to the NICs. You take all those things and you put them into one and you have a fairly extensive firearm sales database. Right. You, you know who the gun owners are. You may not know specifically what guns they own, which is the last piece of the puzzle, right? Now all I got to do is pass legislation that says... Yeah, now you have to not only hand over that information, but you also have to hand over the serial number and the type of gun, tying it specifically to that person. That's all it's really left for them to do, but they can do that anyway through all the other data they've collected. Right. They already know you're a gun owner, and under certain circumstances, they even know what guns you own. And so it is, in essence, a registry. And nobody wants to talk about this in the federal government. We don't have representatives we have a handful of representatives saying, what are you doing, ATF? Show us what you're doing with this information. But there's no accountability right now. Well, yeah. I mean, the the the, the politicians that do care, that want to know that information, currently have no power to, to right. get it yep. and request it. Now, there's another thing that's going on, and this is to the e-file system, Jason, that you and I were talking about. So the e-file system was supposed to speed things up. So for Form 1s, Form 4s, basically, they're manufacturing or transferring an NFA item to your possession. You would fill out paperwork, lick the stamp, stick it on the envelope, go get your pictures from Walgreens, you know, go get to the local police department, get your fingerprints done, pay them whatever fee they charged. Then you throw it all in a packet and duplicate and mail it off to ATF. ATF then sits on it for six months. Then they mail it off to the FBI. The FBI sits on it for six months. They mail it back to the ATF. ATF sits on it for another three months, put it in an envelope with the approval and then mail it to you. So 12 plus months later, you get your approval for something you paid for a year ago, mm -hmm. right? So this e-file system was supposed to speed things up for everybody, yeah. right? And for a while there, it did. I remember years ago when Copper was in the old building, I was using the e-file system for Form 1s, 
And it was coming back very quickly within weeks, at the longest, a couple of months. And so they, they were going to do this now with the Form 4 system. So you could transfer NFA, NFA items between people much more quickly, right? Or buying something from an FFL dealer much more quickly. And so recently, I submitted forms for suppressors. You've submitted some forms, submitted some forms. And we're four or five months in through the e-file system and still no approvals. And so we don't know how long this is going to go. We're going to run the clock on this one and we're going to make another video with an update. Mm -hmm. But this is right back to the, the same ridiculousness because all the money you pay in tax stamps, the $200 fees, that you, taxes that you have to pay, that money doesn't go back to ATF to hire more examiners to process this work. That goes into a general kitty that goes out to, you know, welfare, paying off student loan debt, whatever the government wants to throw money at with a leaf blower. Mm -hmm. That money doesn't go back in to hire more people to make it more quick for the gun owner. It, it just mounts up and right. it's ridiculous. <clears throat> um, before... Before the e-file thing, I think the longest stamp, and that was the old method, if you will, was 15 months on, on one. It finally showed up. But this e-file thing, you know, we assist the customer because it's an e-file thing. You have to, you and the customer put in your information to do the transfer there. I, I, we have a silencer shop kiosk. Well, it's not, we do our own like fingerprinting kiosk and yes, everything here, but there's here. a verification, right? They put in their verification pin, we put in ours, and that's how we do it face-to-face. -face, a virtual well. handshake. Essentially, right. you both <clears throat> are present and certify. Exactly, certify. So, you know, I helped you through your, you know, stamps because that's what we do. At the new Copper, process, we yes. use the process, right, and help you certify. And then, you know, I had somebody that sits with mine I want to say back in May is around the time we, we did yours. And then I think I have one in June, but I think recently a customer got his back in seven months. Yep, I'm on five on my e last submission. System. Now, mind you, this was this whole 90 days thing. Now we all kind of scoffed at it and said, yeah, right. You know what I mean? Uh, and then there was some truth to it because we got some people that got it back right at 90 days. In the yeah. very early days mm -hmm. when it first was implemented. And then we had a theory that it was like 90 government business days. And they didn't <laughs> count like weekends or holidays, holidays or anything right. like that, right? Yeah. And at this point, that theory is just out the window because the <laughs> seven months, I mean, it's just like the old paper method. You know what yeah. I mean? So again, we're going right back. That You have... The form has these barcodes that you scan with like the serial number and everything, like everything is completely streamlined, digital. The fingerprints are digital, the photograph digital, everything. And still, here we are. It's like right back to the same old paper. And just a couple of years ago, end. we were still doing paperwork. Mm -hmm. In the, you know, in 2020, we were still doing paperwork where mm -hmm. you're taking physical photos and getting physical fingerprints and, and gluing it, it to your yeah, and trying to glue it yeah. there and don't put the staple in the wrong spot. Yep. But there was something else mm -hmm. that, that used to take place back when I was doing forms 20 years ago is that if you submitted a form and there was an error on the form, they would mail that paperwork back to you with a little highlight marker. It's like, correct this, please. Mm -hmm. You correct that. And you knew you had two weeks to go because the minute you drop that in the mailbox back to them, two weeks later, you got your approval back. Right. So I recently filed a form one on a pistol. I wanted to turn it into a rifle, actually a couple of them I submitted. And there were and three. So two of the three were denied. It wasn't denied, just rejected. Right. And it was done digitally. So filled out everything digitally, submitted the form one digitally. And instead of of, of saying you need to change this, they just reject the entire transaction, refund your $200 and make you start from zero. Yep. And that is just to harass gun owners because the, the old days of just making a simple correction, it should be even easier in digital format to make a correction mm -hmm. and just go ahead and not go through the time and expense of refunding money and all this other nonsense. It's creating more work for them and it's creating a hassle for us and it's purely to dissuade us from using the system. Right, because I don't know how many people actually use the ATF website. I can tell you it's not exactly the fastest thing in the world to navigate. No, it looks like it was not designed in 1992. But yeah, the, the fact to re essentially reject it and refund and not give any option to correct, like you said, digitally is probably the easiest way to correct. You know what I mean? And so, and then their drop down thing, and this is manufacturing like short barrel rifles and things. There's a different process right. than transferring a suppressor from the store to you type of thing. Um, those used to take 
seven days or something like that. You know, and my theory was, well, they already know that you have the weapon. All you're doing is asking for permission to put a stock on it or whatever. Paying your tax to the right. king. So, and yeah. Thanks for registering. Go ahead and yourself. put your stock on. You know what I mean? Right. But with now, even those are taking three, four months or right. something like that to get your stamp back for that. So, And here's the kicker. And here's the kicker in all this. The two rejections that I got, both of those, because you were with me, both of those were in the ATF's drop down or the next drop down, mm -hmm. ATF drop down. They were in the drop down list. I just simply models. selected what they already had there. Yeah. And then they came back and said, nope, that's not a valid submission. Uh, talking, uh, they, I even sent them pictures of the gun via email. I contacted them and said, I think you made a mistake. Here's here's a picture of the gun, the markings that are on the gun, which match what I submitted. And then I went to the manufacturer's website, screenshotted the website that gave the same name that I used in the submission. I sent that all to them via email and I just got a one sentence response back. It's mm -hmm. incorrect. Just submit it using the correct nomenclature. Mm -hmm. No I, assistance I mean, whatsoever. I used their own drop down. I showed proof, physical proof of the markings on the gun and the manufacturer's website. And they still refunded my $200 and said, nope, sorry, we're not doing it. Yep. Pure harassment, pure harassment. Absolutely. So, I mean, this stuff is not there to be your friend and, and help you through anything. No, they're not me. trying to, yeah, it's, no. It's, You're helping them register yourself as a mm -hmm. gun owner. And then once you give them all your information, they may or may not even give you permission to have whatever it is. Right. And, and it's just, man, it, it, and, and it's just getting progressively worse. And they're slipping this stuff in, just like we're talking about this fix nicks and the, you know, the reporting update of 2022 that was slipped in that nobody even saw coming. Most people and representatives don't even think this is gun control, but it most certainly is because what they're doing is collect, they're, they're creating more avenues for them to collect more information on you to put in this database that doesn't exist legally so that they, whenever, and, and we've been warning this and people call us conspiracy theorists and, and all this stuff, but they do want to know who you are and what you have because when the bans come, they want to know exactly where they're going and what type of resistance they may meet with. Exactly. That's and, all this is about. And the, you know, the whole idea that, and I know there's going to be some people on, that watching this are going to say, I don't get delayed anyway. I get instant approved. I'm not worried about it. Well, guess what? If they want to go ahead and delay you that one time to get the information, they're going to. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and it's more and than just idea. you too. Like I have, I had a delay once and I was like, oh my God, what, what could be going wrong? You right. Know, like I've never been delayed. What's going on? have no idea. But again, they don't tell us mm -mm. when a delay happens. It's not like delayed for reason. There's no reason. Denial is why. the same thing. There's they no just say reason. you're denied. You, yeah. Why? Not telling you. Exactly. So they don't tell you anything. They will tell you. There is a process. Well, but that, that's, mm -hmm. that, that's just for the person that was denied that wants to go through the process and submit all the, the, the formal paperwork. Mm -hmm. But well, that's, that's as the dealer, thing. you can't tell your customer why they were denied well, or delayed. And, and I can understand that because that's a point of privacy. Like <clears> you can't tell a dealer, you know, uh, uh, criminal information on somebody or whatever. I, I mean, I can understand why they wouldn't put that to the dealer, but the 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 uh, process to which either you find to find out why you're delayed or to appeal your denial is really the same process. It's basically the NFA process. You have to submit a handwritten letter, submit fingerprints, fill out the form, you send it in, photos. Uh, I don't know if it's photos. Okay. I don't think so. I think it's just fingerprints. Okay. Now, on on the um, on the denial appeal, you also have to have a transaction number from the denied background check, which is the what dealer provides. Like, hey, this was denied. Here's your transaction number to do the appeal process for it. That appeal process can take well over a year. And I've seen people get through it in three months. I've seen it go way over a year. So let's say you, you are falsely denied and you're going through the appeal process. That means you are unconstitutionally, you, you have your, your second amendment right unconstitutionally revoked for a year. While they're dragging their while feet. While they drag it. You can't purchase anything. You can't really right. do any of that. And if you continue to make attempt to make purchases and keep getting denied, you're guaranteeing a visit. Here's another ATF FFL regulation. If we knowingly run another check on a denied person without either a appeal approval 
or written approval from an, an oh gosh, the compliance agent can't do it, from a field agent, like a local field agent, you, you, that's a, a knock and they can take your FFL. You can't, so let's say- Unbelievable. Let's say uh, I had a customer who came, got denied. And then he's like, oh, I think I figured it out. My cousin's got the same name as me and he's a felon. So they're denying me because of that. I've never been arrested. I've never had anything, any issues. I'm just going to get another like, crack at like, it. He's like, can yeah. you run me again? I'm going to put my social this time, right? Where I, maybe I didn't do the, the day before. I cannot do that unless I have an appeal or I have a, a written approval from an agent. I can't do that. And, and again, guys... <laughs> The vast, 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 overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelming majority of delays, English term, denials and delays are false. The, there's no reason for them. It was a mistake. And, uh, or it was a and mistake. Reason, uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, not all of them, but several, like a, a good majority. So my anecdotal experience, a good majority of the denials are appealed and approved. I think... If I remember all all my customers who've appealed denials, I think all but one eventually has been reversed. It's just absolutely unbelievable. And this is stuff that we need to put to our representatives, right? This is These are things that you should call your representatives about and let them know what's going on. And if we just sit around and we do nothing, which is, it seems to be the case with a lot of gun owners, like you were saying, Jason, that eh, doesn't really affect me. I've never had a delay yet. But what about your next door neighbor? It's not mm -hmm. just about you. Right. It's about our collective rights. Exactly. Quit right. So I'm politically yourself. active for people I've never met. Mm -hmm. I fight and put my name on lists and do things to, you know, put myself in the crosshairs of the federal government because I'm actively fighting for our collective rights. Mm -hmm. If I was just going to sit around and do nothing and worry just about me, then that would be a completely different story. We, we need to stop this, you know, this introverted view of gun rights and all become politically active and worry about our rights, our constitution, because we're, we have to hand these freedoms down to our children. Right. And if you're not being politically active, you're being remiss because you're allowing tyranny to take over. Yep. And so it's, it's absolutely critical that you guys, you know, first of all, join a group like GOA. Um, you can go to gunowners.org. You can sign up for free emails. And these emails will give you alerts when seemingly innocuous bills that everybody else will ignore. Uh, GOA will send out an alert saying, hey guys, this is out there and you need to be politically active, you can sign up for those alerts for free. I would prefer that you would actually join GOA. They're absolutely uh, one of the most powerful gun lobby organizations in DC, one of just a handful. Uh, many of the gun rights groups don't have any presence in DC. GOA or Gun Owners of America does. And so joining them and becoming politically uh, active is absolutely critical. So please do swing by and check them out. And can, consider I, joining. can I make a comment on GOA real quick? Yes. So what they do is they take the work out. So when we talk about this stuff, I'm sure a lot of you at home are saying, how am I supposed to know all of this information? How am I supposed to follow it? How am I supposed to be informed in which now I can make informed political decisions on which senators and representatives to vote for, who to su support for sheriff, all those things. So what GOA does is hand a lot of this information over to you on a platter. So by supporting them, you're getting that information at a click of a button instead of you having to to put in a bunch of requests with political offices you know try to follow you know supreme court cases or even you know lower court cases so what they're going to do is take that information and put it all to you on a platter that's easily right. searchable and then if you have a question ask them right mm -hmm. you know request that information and they make you know message messaging your politicians they make it easy so um there's a a huge value in what they're giving. So right. go Plus check them out. E even if you're not going to give them money right off the bat, go check out what they have to offer and then, you know, make an educated decision on, on your support. But, but but if you join, you're also funding boots on the ground, yeah. which the vast majority of gun rights groups, even the NRA has minimal presence in DC anymore after they moved to Texas. GOA is the most active on the hill of all the gun rights groups. And when you support them, you're, you're financing those boots on the ground that are in there going through 
the halls of Congress looking for information. They're, they're supporting, uh, many times in the last couple of years, they've been getting leaked documents from the FBI and ATF that they publish. You're paying to help support that because they are the organization that these you know, whistleblowers go to, to get that information out. And so it's important that we support that that type of activism. So guys, again, please check out Gun Owners of America. That's gunowners.org or ORG as the domain name. Guys, if you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel so we can continue to bring you information like this, please consider becoming part of our Patreon family. There is a link in the video description below. Also right here on YouTube, you got the join button underneath the video player you're watching right now. Click that join button and you can support us here in the age of demonetization. Also, please swing by and check out Copper Custom. Thank you for 14 years of support. Please be, be politically active. We'll talk to you guys soon. Take care, guys.